Hello and welcome uh, to this webinar. As you know, it's titled Consumer Trends That Are Powering the New World Order. My name is uh, Tanya Bharatwaj. I lead the SME business for InstaRM in India and also drive content and thought leadership uh, at the company. Over the next 60 minutes, uh, what we're really going to try and do is talk about the consumer trends in the, you know, the context of COVID-19. I think a lot of you, uh, you know, will sort of agree with me that the pandemic has somewhat ripped up the rule book, uh, you know, if you like, forcing a lot of businesses to sort of rethink about how they talk to their consumers. And so we thought, we, you know, we'll stitch together uh, a panel of veterans, as it were, uh, and, you know, have them share some of their hard-won insights, uh, which I'm really hoping will sort of help you add to your ammo and arsenal to, you know, navigate this new world order, as we sort of like to call it. Uh, so let me get you acquainted first uh, with our panelists. Uh, first up, we've got Yogesh. Uh, Yogesh Sangle heads up the consumer and SME business at uh, Niam. This really involves, you know, launching innovative products uh, that try and break currency borders and really add value to a wide range of customer segments. I'm sure a lot of you in, you know, in the participants will sort of be very familiar uh, with Yogesh. Uh, you know, he's led and managed uh, the regional business for companies like PayPal, Citibank, and MoneyGram. So welcome, Yogesh. It's a pleasure to have you. Yep, thanks. Thanks thanks a lot. Uh, uh, thanks, Tanya. And, and uh, welcome to Rana and Stephanie. Thanks for joining this webinar. And really happy to be chatting with you, uh, especially because you know offline coffees and, and, uh, and uh, lunches are not possible. So I think this is the best way to get together, right? Uh, so really happy about that. So. Thanks, thanks, Tanya. Thanks for that. Super. Okay, next up then is Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie is the head of financial services for Singapore and Southeast Asia at Facebook. Uh, as a client partner, she really drives all of, you know, uh, Facebook's family of apps, regional financial services, uh, strategic initiatives. She's got close to 17 years of experience, uh, you know, in consumer financial services. She's worked with the likes of Standard Chartered and MasterCard and Stephanie big thank you for taking the time out today. Thank you so much, uh, Tanya, Yogesh and Rana for having me here. I'm really excited to, to be here to share with you also, um, you know, uh, one of the research that we've recently conducted, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But I'm really thrilled to, to, to be here to, you know, to spend, you know, one hour with you and, and of course, with the viewers as well. Super. We're looking forward to all those insights then, Stephanie. Thanks. Uh, our third panelist is uh, Rana. Rana Saha, he's a senior director of marketing at Grab, uh, where he heads up their performance marketing and CRM organizations uh, that mainly sort of involves, you know, defining strategy, execution, as well as the measurement of both paid and owned media uh, marketing initiatives across all lines of businesses at Grab. Uh, he has close to 20 years of experience. And this sort of really ranges, you know, across startups to Fortune 500 companies. Rana, thanks for making the time for us today. Thank you again, Tanya, and really great to have this conversation with Stephanie and Yogesh. Look, a couple of thoughts from me just to get started, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's been a bit of a blur for me this whole year. It's gone <laughs> by, it's been absolutely crazy, and I've just gone with the flow and tried to keep up with things. So you know, when uh, Yogesh connected with me and said, hey, let's do this, I was like, okay, this became a forcing function for me to take a step back and think about everything that's gone on this year. So, you know, I don't know if I'll have any wonderful, amazing insights. I'm not that smart, but I would, I'll, I'll be keen to share sort of what we've gone through. And then maybe, you know, it's an affirmation of what many of us have gone through. So it's good to kind of come to kind of share that. I'm excited about it. Great. We look forward to it. Thank you. So big thank you to all three of you. And I'm going to get started then. And, and Yogesh, uh, you know, uh, first question really to you. Um, you know, besides uh, what many would say, the Zoom boom and the Netflix veg out, I think one of the main highlights for 2020 and, you know, the lockdown has been this across the board sort of leap that we've seen in uh, digital activity. Uh, you know, Oftentimes, uh, people that I speak to, you know, say that, you know, this crisis has actually 
brought forward the digital transformation by something like five to 10 years. Uh, I'm interested to hear from you. What are some of the trends that you've seen emerge as a consequence of this sort of COVID induced lockdown? Yeah, no, uh, it's a good question and a good question to start with. So thanks, thanks for asking that. Uh, I think multiple things, right? I mean, one of the one of the key things for us was, uh, you know, and as in financial services, uh, was that you know things have we didn't think things would accelerate at the pace that they have. And you know, I've worked in banks for several years, and Stephanie's uh, had a long innings in in one uh, one of the larger banks. And it was next to impossible for us to even get our work home. Like the amount of amount of VPNs and multiple layers that you would go to just log in and, and check your email it was like, like I have a friend who carries two mobiles. One is just the work mobile. He doesn't touch it for anything else. And one another mobile, which is for uh, personal work. So, you know, suddenly you have to do everything at home. So it's, it's like massive in terms of, you know, the amount of, amount of changes, amount of infrastructure. I actually was, was very intrigued because after about a month of, of uh, the lockdown in, in Singapore, we had the DBS leadership team coming and singing praises for the IT department for getting them working uh, from, from home. And it was actually a CEO singing. Yeah? I mean, it was, it was really fun. But, you know, uh, at the same time, it, it kind of uh, made like no IT department anywhere no government initiative anywhere would have propelled us the way we've been propelled in the last, you know, six, seven months. Like we're doing things that we never thought we would do sitting at home. Uh, and, and we are comfortable doing that, which is, which is the more, like this is not something like a forced function. I, I find it difficult to get people now. We've, in Singapore, we do limited uh, work from office and I find it difficult to get people to come in. They ask, you know, is it required? We can do a Teams call or a Zoom call. And I'm like, I'm cool. I have no issues whatsoever <laughs> because it's the way we are thinking and working. So that's how we've been going. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Uh, Rana, let me come to you. And, you know, I think Yogesh very nicely sort of summed up what it's been like for pretty much anyone you, you know, you talk to around the world. Um, but I just want to look at things from a, um, you know, a sort of corporate lens now. Digital transformation has really been a sort of corporate buzzword for years. And it looks like the pandemic has really forced that change for consumers. Um, I want you to reflect a little bit for us on the pace of that change, right? The fact that we've sort of adopted, I think that's a no-brainer. But what about how quickly that's happened? You know, you have folks saying, oh, that, you know, the changes that take years for consumers to build have happened overnight. Would you agree with that? I, I, I think I would. And, you know, you mentioned it's a buzzword and I'm just thinking back on the years, right? Every year in every organization <laughs> I've been in, like we have the annual process planning process and then you have some slides and I make up those slides and digital transformation, what I'm gonna do in all of these <laughs> areas. So we seem to go through it, you know, every year. And so this time I feel it's, it, it's for real, right? And for many, many companies across, you know, industries and across different uh, regions as well. So, uh, maybe I'll try to take this question from a couple of angles, right? One is from a graph perspective. We are a technology company and, you know, we are mobile first. So inherently there's something digital in terms of what we are doing. So it's for, for us, it's not as much of a transformation by way of, you know, business operations versus a need for us to figure out how we collaborate across the team better through digital interactions rather than physical which is something that, you know, we've taken for granted for, you know, a long time. And then how do we pivot our, our execution plans and priorities from, you know, a line of business, which was a key business for us about transport, which was severely impacted virtually overnight to, you know, changing customer behavior with this dramatic inflection point around COVID where, you know, the, the needs of demands from consumers for, food delivery or grocery delivery or cashless payments, you know, that just skyrocketed. So how do we pivot all of our, you know, operations and processes to enable this, this change, right? So that was kind of more that we went through, but, you know, if I think of what's going on from talking to peers outside of Grab as well, 
Um, yes, I think most leaders feel that the, this crisis has forced you know, a, a transformation much faster. I mean, you can read different articles, but you know, five, six, or seven is typically what as you know, people feel as the average, right? So, and um, as, as I think through it, the fascinating thing for me here is that for many business leaders, it's a bit of a conundrum, right? Uh, on the one hand, you have your business, which is, you know, severely impacted by COVID and, you know, there's revenue losses and what have you. And so you're expected to be a, you know, responsible steward of company capital and cash. So manage your expenses. And at the same time, there's this imperative to, you know, invest in digital transformation and spend a lot of money there, right? So, because if you don't do that and the economy turns around, you know, you'll be left behind by the competition who is investing in it. So I, I don't think, you know, I can necessarily provide guidance for each and every situation, but for leaders in different businesses, they have to think through, okay, you know what, how do I be responsible with the capital of the investments on my side? And how do I also be able to meet the needs of consumers and, you know, deal with competitive factors as well, right? When the economy does, does turn around. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's actually a very interesting point. And, you know, I would like to get Yogesh's comments on that conundrum that Rana's talked about. But before I do that, uh, Stephanie, you know, opening sort of comments from you as well, this COVID-induced digital dependence. Um, how would you say different from what we've seen, let's say, in the past, where, you know, again, when it comes to consumer behavior? Okay, I, I mean, look, um, I do think that 2020 is a pivotal year. I mean, if you ask anybody, you know, if the world is going to come to a standstill, right? Last year, you know, no one would, would have imagined that that to happen, right? But it did uh, because of, of COVID, you know, the pandemic. So I feel like, you know, the social distancing also paved the way for like more home center lifestyle, home centric lifestyles, and also like commerce with really minimal physical contact, right? So really, this means that, you know, uh, with this extensive economic disruption, there were fewer opportunities for people to really spend, to shop, travel, or even carry out essential tasks, right? And for many businesses, the only way to secure, you know, their future was to really establish a robust digital presence. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the, the research that Facebook together with Bain and Company commissioned earlier this year in May. Uh, we surveyed over 16,000 digital consumers across six markets. Uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, and Vietnam on emerging trends and rising opportunities um, shaping, you know, this, this, this region. So one of the critical insights, you talked about it earlier, Tania, about like, you know, is, is digital transformation taking place faster than, than it, it did, right, before uh, this, this whole pandemic. So one of the critical insights we found out was that five years of digital transformation happened within a single year, this year. Right. Mm -hmm. So by end of this year, um, the number of digital consumers in Southeast Asia would reach 310 million. Right. A number that we previously forecasted to only reach in 2025. So it really, this means like 70 percent of Southeast Asia consumers will, will go digital by 2020. So, yes, I truly believe that, um, you know, COVID, this pandemic uh, has really accelerated the pace of digital growth, um, you know, for, for Southeast Asia. Super. So I, I'm going to come back to you, Stephanie, on right. you know some of these other insights uh, that we can sort of talk about from this report. But uh, Yogesh, to just come back to you know the point about the conundrum that Rana was talking about, and I think before we move forward, I, I want you to sort of draw from your experience and you know talk to the audience about one uh, you know how how was how was that period, right? Because we have effectively fast forwarded five years. Um, so a little bit on you know the challenges that came along. Yeah, and and uh, it was an interesting period, right? Because mm -hmm. I think, uh, and uh, and probably Stephanie will will vouch for it. But uh, but the cost of doing advertising on Google and Facebook became very cheap, right, at that <laughs> point of time. But nobody wanted to spend. So uh, and probably it was the best time. But but at the same time, I think for companies like us who are who are not listed and we we depend on funding and we still have a path to profitability that we are working on. It was very important for us to conserve cash. So, you know, while while it was like the best opportunity to go advertise, really get, you know, do a land grab, get as many customers as possible. 
uh, we had to also conserve cash so it was very very difficult so we had to do those measured really measured ways of kind of going forward and our business was going through the roof right for especially a business like ours which is purely digital and and people where we started getting customers who had never used us so we are mainly a millennial focused uh, business which uh, which is focused on you know affluent and 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 uh, you know uh, wanna be affluent uh, in terms of uh, the way we look at uh, our customer segment but we had people across the various phases of life and various stages of life and various income groups who who started using us and using us very very quickly so we had to pivot to that you know our regular marketing regular advertising wouldn't work uh, because these were different customers also our user experiences had to change we had to make changes uh, you know and regulators were were very very uh, uh, proactive so we had to work with them uh, with work with these proactive change the way we onboarded customers and really get them going so that you know we not inconvenient things because in some cases it was it was a matter of health and life and death right we didn't want people to go out and queue up uh, and in, uh, you know especially in places like dormitories in singapore where we were really ensuring or trying to ensure that people don't really step out and 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 can do this in the convenience of their uh, homes but at the same time you know uh, we had to kind of uh, uh, ensure that uh, that uh, that we take care of uh, regulatory needs so that was another conundrum we were trying to solve while yeah. we were trying to grow right okay great um at this point i would really urge the audiences to please sort of you know leave behind any comments questions we're happy to take them you know as we kind of go through a round of questions um i want to now shift focus and talk a little bit about um you know how and what if at all uh, did the apac region really stand out because that's what we sort of promised the audience here that we're going to talk about asia pacific and so rana let me let me ask you um how would you say asia or asia pacific sort of acted reacted differently in these times versus uh, say other parts within you know the asian region or even versus uh, the rest of the world you know would there be any differences or similarities i suppose similarities we we kind of touched upon but something that stood out uniquely for a certain region yeah so it's another really good question and a topic of discussion i suppose um, uh, and you know the way i look at it there's there's uh, you know variations in terms of how consumers have reacted across different markets in the region Mm -hmm. but i ultimately think that this more that is similar and binds all of us together than this different and so my philosophy in terms of you know how i'm sort of managing the team and how organizations uh, should be trying to navigate through this unique environment is that this more benefits to be had by addressing similarities in customer needs and sentiments first than trying to solve for the differences right i i mean i very much acknowledge that there'll be differences but there's more that's similar than different so if we solve for the similarities first then we move on to sort of how do we adjust to those differences right so i think maybe that's something as maybe a bit you know contrary to what a lot of people believe but that's kind of my fundamental um you know mindset in terms of approaching this so if i think of you know the the asia pac region and i'll probably limit my um you know thoughts more to southeast asia because i see more of that right than you know um let's see japan so i may defer to a little bit of uh, you know so to your gauge or or stephanie on that i think there's um three or four things i see that are um common emerging themes in each of these countries and where you know consumer sentiment or or beliefs around these themes are at different points in a continuum but it gives me a framework to you know get a mental model of how do i understand what's going on in different countries right so the first one to me is around you know consumer confidence right i think confidence overall i'd say is declining you know yeah i think you know for, at least for the rest of this year most consumers will be cautious at best 
Um, you know, there's obviously unemployment that's impacted different markets to different degrees as well. And, you know, for, especially for youngsters, they may have previously had sort of a, you know, spend, spend free, um, do whatever I want kind of mindset. And so many of the youngsters in the region are facing constraints, spending constraints for the first time, right? So, so you know, this whole notion of consumer confidence, that's, you know, we'll see how that changes next year. I mean, many of the economists are predicting that, hey, there's going to be, you know, a good rebound in 2021 in this region, and there's going to be a lot of, um, you know, pent up desire for, you know, I guess the term is revenge spending. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yes. There may be a lot of revenge spending going on sometime, right? So, but yeah, I just yeah. want to leave you with this notion of consumer confidence. That's something that I think about in terms of what's going on in different markets, right? That's mm -hmm. one. The second thing is, um, in my view, and you know, Stephanie and some of the research that Facebook has done will probably attest to it, there's just an increasing digital footprint, right? Uh, most of the youngsters in this region, they are, you know, they have been early digital adopters even before COVID and everything else happened, right? So if you think about e-gaming or, you know, ride hailing, online shopping festivals, live streaming, a lot of these things, you know, folks were using even before COVID came around. So now, now that, you know, folks are locked up at home, we are seeing an increase in digital adoption across countries, right? Indonesia and Singapore, I think, you know, those are two countries I've worked, I'm working very closely with. I see a lot of increase in digital adoption there. So, um, and, and then, you know, obviously if you're staying at home, you know, you talked about sort of the Netflix um, was it veg out? Veg out. <laughs> uh <-huh. Yes. laughs> um, and then, you know, what I call, I'm sort of digressing a little bit here, but I call the TMZ phenomenon and that's not the tabloid, right? It's like, you know, teams uh, meet Zoom, right? We have that <laughs> phenomenon going on as well, right? So, so, you know, consumers are spending more time at home. They're not going out. Uh, they're not as socializing. So they're shopping has increased a lot, right? Online shopping, that's just grown tremendously. And, you know, many, many companies are seeing that, right? A lot of shift to online and just, you know, increase there. And new categories are spinning up there too. I mean, video streaming, we talked about with food delivery, which we're seeing at Grab, right? E-gaming, telemedicine, you know, you hear about that as well, you know? I mean, digital payments and e-wallets and all. I mean, I don't know, Yogesh, I'm sure you can talk to that too. Yeah. So there's this just much more not just more, but a lot of diversification in terms of online shopping that, you know, we're seeing, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe the last thing that I see, and I I'm, I'm perhaps too old to really understand this well, but, you know, in, in this region, there's a socially inspired shopping, a social commerce, I guess we're calling it, you know, Consumers are using social media in a lot of different ways, and there's you know strong powers of influence. So, new innovate, style innovations, peer reviews, you know KOLs, you know, the young people are just unafraid to share their opinions about different things. And so there's this, you know, there's an immense power being influenced. I personally, frankly, don't identify with it, you know, but I can see it happening, right? So I'd leave it to, you know, smarter people than myself to comment on that part of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Stephanie, before I come to you about the findings, I'll get a quick word from Yogesh. Uh, Yogesh, if you can quickly also sort of touch upon uh, what sort of stands out for you when it comes to the APAC yeah. region. Yeah, I mean, I'm like, yeah, the Asian male learned to cook and clean, <laughs> so that's probably a, a big thing, yeah. But having said that, I think- Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but but more importantly, I think uh, I think lots of different trends. Like if Asia is not one country, right? It's, it's different sets of people in different areas. And and like Rana, I would say that you know commonality is better than differences and stuff like that. But we see it across across multiple uh, levels that that things have changed. And I think the two things that uh, stood out for me in terms of changes uh, is is education, right? I mean. Everybody's working and, and kids are studying from home. Uh, my kids were asked to uh, study from home and we were like all in different rooms trying to figure out. But some of these are, are really, uh, really, uh, you know, strong social stories, right? In India, people are 
are selling farms to buy a mobile so that you know their children can study it's it's a big deal right not everybody has a mobile phone now not everybody has an android phone or you know a device to connect so that's one thing you know even in a country like singapore uh, you know some of the studies showed that there was there was a gap and there were some people who didn't have uh, in uh, you know computers at home they were using their phones to connect and this is you know in a country which is uh, which is so developed so i'm saying that it's, it's impacted so there will be uh, people who will be left behind and that's something that a lot of uh, you know ngos will have to come forward to kind of move that forward otherwise there would be a generation which will be left behind and the disparity will grow so that's one concern the second thing is uh, uh, that i saw was gaming and gaming kind of booming and 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 going through the roof right and i will definitely can definitely talk about it i think facebook is right front and center and i think one of the biggest games that uh, millennials found was called robin hood where they started gaming uh, on stock and and okay. and you know some like some of the stuff was just bizarre right and you know it it but you know i mean it's it's real it's not it's not uh, uh, a trend anymore this it's there to stay so companies have to design stuff around around uh, folks uh, going online and, and changing the way uh, they interact right mm-hmm. right okay stephanie so then it's uh, sort of over to you i mean you know i did go through the the facebook and bain and company um, you know joint study and you talked about you know the digital consumers discovery habits how they're changing how customers are open to switching brands uh, and you know and so on and so forth so you know enlighten us with what else that study threw up yeah actually the study right threw up um, um 10 10 10 insights actually um but i think uh you know we'll we'll, we'll just pick up the critical the critical ones right So I think you, uh, Rana also spoke about it. I, I think in every country that we're seeing in Southeast Asia, we're definitely seeing more offline shoppers, you know, moving online, right? And at the same time, um, these consumers aren't just only spending more online, but they're also buying into more categories. So um, the research indicator that, like in tw- this year, like consumers are going online to buy on average five categories, which is really an increase of forty percent in just one year. And then you talked about right consumers openness to switching brands. and uh, this was a key trait that we saw across southeast asian consumers as well and on average like 54% say they change uh, their most purchased brand in the three months prior to the study and the top two reasons for that were really due to uh, reliability and also value i think reliability means like in terms of product quality and value is you know attractive pricing that they they can see online so what does this mean for brands right um this presents both an opportunity and also a challenge On one hand, consumers uh, that are open to switching means you know businesses have to be more innovative to retain loyalty, right? Then on the other, a more receptive audience means brands have like more space to be more creative and experimental in their offerings, right? Uh, their approach and the way that they reach out to the consumers. So um, very interestingly, right? Um, There is some variation though uh, around this uh, switching of brands. Uh, so in Vietnam, Thailand, and Malaysia. uh it, those consumers there are willing to switch things a little bit more um but in singapore right uh, only one third of respondents said that you know they were switch brands so it's quite interesting you know uh, uh how the, the psyche of the singaporean consumer um then which brings me really around like how do then consumers discover brands right particularly during this time so uh and what your guest rightfully mentioned as well uh the, the top online activities uh or platforms uh are social media <laughs> messaging video streaming and gaming in, in that order so uh this really underscores the growing influence of platforms uh you know that they they have on digital consumers dig, uh decision making so in fact uh based on another research done by yougov um we saw like around 30 to 38% of southeast asian consumers um uh, they use social media messaging and video streaming Uh, more often in the past three months uh, than they did before, right? And this was done. This research was done in April. So I I would say that um, you know uh, a lot of uh, discovery is now ov- obviously done through these channels, and uh, we would kind of like break down break them down into like two categories. Like there are online discovery channels where you know it refers to channels where people are browsing through you know their feed without really looking for something specific. 
um, you know, such as social media, podcasts, you know, messaging, and even gaming sites, right? And the second one is more online intentional channels. Like people who use these channels, they have to kind of like type out what they're looking for. Um, and, and uh, you know, when they use uh, uh, e-commerce sites uh, on search, on, on site search bar. So like more than half of these uh, online purchases, um, you know, really started via discovery chat, discovery commerce, like what uh, Rana was mentioning, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, so I really think that these findings really suggest that online discovery uh, channels play a very big role in consumers' decision making. Um, you know, um, making them you know um, as uh, a, a very very useful uh, online channel, uh, including intentional channels. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I, I don't know about you folks, but I definitely <laughs> discovered a whole bunch of brands on Instagram. <laughs> Very, very surprisingly. Yeah, so yeah, yeah I have been yeah. shopping a lot as well. Yeah, <laughs> discovering new brands on my feet, right? Yeah. <laughs> to keep okay, influencers, um, like what Rana yeah. said. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. Uh, you know what? We've got two questions, and so let me just take those as well. Um, Yogesh, this one's coming for you. It's from an anonymous attendee. Um, it says, "What are the dangers of digital dependence uh, or a cashless society from a financial point of view?" Uh, I think a, a challenge around around anything which is, as we call it, card not present or a person not present kind of transaction is fraud. And fraud is a is a serious concern, especially as as the silver generation, you know, tends to kind of uh, get into online shopping. Uh, the amount of frauds have gone through the roof, and you know, if you look at any reports, like the amount of calls that people are getting. Uh, and the amount of uh, you know phishing attacks they've just gone through the roof. So there needs to be a balance around that, right? And and that's the piece because you know it's hard-earned money and people are unsure of, of how they are kind of being conned. And some of this stuff is, is even though there is a lot of education, there's still gaps, right? And especially as you're going into uh, rural and semi-urban areas across Asia Pacific. There are people who are not exposed to these frauds, so the fraudsters are finding new people to go after, right? So, so that's one big thing that, uh, and that's where we are spending a lot of time to kind of ensure that uh, that there is education, that there is ways of uh, people, uh, kind of uh, money is safe and secure, and and we put in a lot of things on the back end so that the customer experience, because with this. Uh, generation which is kind of really shifting towards the uh, online uh, you can't put in too much friction so it's a delicate balance between adding uh, extra click and extra friction or extra pop-up versus you know uh, and make uh, versus kind of educating so we are we are constantly making those payoffs and trying to see what is the best way to to uh, to kind of educate at the same time make it easy and that's the that's the big challenge that we are grappling with. So I do believe that that there is concern. Uh, it's concern for the government. It's concern for companies like us. But uh, there are ways and means to kind of prevent this from happening. And if, and and companies like us who are built on technology, online only platform, have kind of thrived and really built uh, systems which could protect customers better. So that's uh, that's kind of my learning from from this phase mm -hmm. okay uh, you know um, i think uh, this will sort of be relevant for the next question as well and uh, you know stephanie maybe you can take that and rana perhaps after that you could add in as well uh, the question again from an anonymous attendee is what are the opportunities and challenges of making payments a seamless process for online shoppers in e-commerce marketplaces considering the surge of users and demand during covid-19 stephanie would you like to go first yeah, so like um, if, if, I can, if, I can, if I can talk about it from like the Facebook perspective, uh, we recognize that, uh, you know, uh, e-commerce, uh, you know, shopping, social commerce is, is becoming, you know, super relevant, right, in, in, in today's uh, era. And I think like uh, we've also rolled out like Facebook shops, you know, uh, Instagram shops. So it's, it's rolling up progressively, you know, across, uh, I mean, globally. Uh, even in the region, like you already, uh, it's already present in Malaysia, where you're able to like embed like you know your your products, you know, within uh, your Instagram feed, um, so that it becomes more seamless uh, mm -hmm. for uh, consumers to you know to click out 
So, you know, we talked a lot about like, you know, in the past where uh, a lot of discovery happens online and then transactions happen offline, but this whole pandemic has changed things up, right? So you could, people are now like, you know, discovering and also making the transaction in that same uh, online, you know, uh, sort of journey. So we want to make sure also that, um, you know, as a business, when you think about like uh, reaching out to your consumers, not just, uh, you know, you have to really have that omni-channel approach. Uh, making mm -hmm. sure that, uh, you know, they are discovering and at the same time, it, the ease of purchase is there. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about like uh, social um, commerce or um, messaging, you know, so that's or what we call like conversational commerce. Um, you use the use of like WhatsApp, Messenger, you know, so in a lot of uh, 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 markets, right, in Southeast Asia, uh, a lot of transactions are also happening through that channel. Uh, I mean, I have bought like many things, you know, through Messenger, you know, all I have to do is just, you know, when I scroll through my Instagram feed and I, I like something, I just message the business and uh, our, we had research to show that seven out of 10, uh, you know, consumers actually prefer to message a business as opposed to like calling or emailing, right? Because it's just, you know, it's just intuitive, right? You just message them, you get a response. So I, I, I think businesses need to consider, um, you know, a really omni-channel approach. Mm -hmm. um, and, and really leveraging on like, you know, what's, what's really available and making sure that the process is as frictionless as possible for the consumers. Okay. I, Stephanie, actually, I want to talk a little bit more about that and I will come back with a more pointed question because I think that will be very relevant for our audience. But uh, Rana, there's a question here which says, you know, as people are now more open to different forms of media consumption and are shopping online more than ever, how can a young financial brand sort of leverage it? That's one question. And I also sort of thought I'll, you know, bung in my own, here, because you, you know, I remember in your initial comments, you talked about how just the pivot and the changes that Grab also had to make, you know, to sort of navigate through what was clearly a crisis. You know, on the business side, I just wanted to also get your thoughts. Changing up, you know, entrenched business processes to make way for new technologies is super hard. Um, what would your advice also be to businesses who are sort of, you know, walking down that path right now? Yeah, um, you know, on this topic, I, I think about it in terms of two two aspects of it. One is the human, the human aspect, and then the other part is the business aspect of it. So, if I just think of how how things have transpired, you know, since the beginning of the year. It's been an interesting period for us, right? Even before this pandemic and everything else, Grab was obviously growing very rapidly. And we were thinking about, oh, I was thinking about, so how do I set up my organization to, you know, scale and meet the needs of the business? So, you know, as, as happens in any kind of team, we had some of the veterans in our team move on to different roles at Grab or outside of Grab. And then we had a lot of new people coming in as well. Um, so, and, you know, business-wise, right, we think about how do we transform our marketing programs and processes from being focused on transport, which is, you know, obviously a core business for us to, you know, food that was picking up and some of these other new verticals that we were getting into. So, so if everyone's locked up at home, then, you know, you have real issues, right? You hire a new person. How do you onboard a new person? You know, okay, you can set them up with a laptop. You know, you can go into the office, but then how do you make them feel part of the team, right? And how, how do you sort of integrate them? Um, you know, establishing sort of a one team spirit and culture. And, you know, you have to re-engineer how our programs operate and how you operate as well, because the face-to-face -face interactions we've always taken for granted, right? And then something else that, you know, impacted me personally is, you know, uh, uh, um, you know nearly half of my team sits outside of Singapore. So they are spread across all the markets that Grab operates in. And, you know, a lot of sort of that human element is there when, you know, I go to the countries and visit them and have different meetings or they come, you know, my team comes into Singapore. So, you know, so there's this whole human aspect of changing business processes, right, um, that, you know, we went through. And many of these, I'm sure, like, you know, the rest of the panelists here and the audience as well have experienced. I mean, you just go through the process, right? Getting your, you know, home technicalities sorted out, right? You know, 
this is a shared space I'm sitting in right now where my wife and kids used to sit. So I've sort of kicked them out for the moment. And hey, you know what? I didn't become a gamer, but I got a gaming chair, right? So <laughs> you know, those, those kinds of things. And then, you know, you do your team coffee breaks, you know, happy hours. You do one-to-one, -one, you know, impromptu, right? If you're in the office, you just walk up to someone's desk and have a chat, right? Now, it's yeah. hard to have that impromptu chat kind of culture and Zoom. So you want to sort of, you have to bit, sort of remind yourself and force that to happening, right? We, you know, in fact, a um, couple of nights back, I hadn't done it for a while, but we did a virtual game session, you know, at night with the team. So, so these are all ways of working, right? Outside of the business that are super important from, from a, you know, human process perspective and, uh, you know, my, I guess my learnings and all of this and sort of what we worked through was, you know, there's the initial denial phase, right? Hey, we cannot do this or, you know, this is going to go away, right? I mean, without yeah. being too political, right? You know, it's like, oh, it's going to go away with the heat, right? So, you know, none of that stuff, you know, played out, right? So, you know, you get past the denial into acceptance. But then again, you know, why do you get into that acceptance mode and things, you know, Yogesh, you were mentioning earlier that, you know, you start getting comfortable and you'd be able to work through it, but it's not a one-time deal that you have to remind yourself to keep at it and keep those human connections going through this whole, you know, through this whole um, uh, time frame, right? And this is going to continue to next year as well. So that's the whole human part of it. And then you come to... Uh, you know, I guess the business aspects, right? So what we had to go through at Grab is, you know, adjust some of our digital strategies and processes to the new normal. So, you know, we are a mobile first organization, um, but at the end of the day, our, our business and, you know, how we serve customers, not, you know, just, you know, digital, right? It is how we bring digital and the physical worlds together and drive the seamless integration, right? For for you know what, what we are trying to do at Grab, so you know you think of very simple stuff, right? Just like I said, new team members being onboarded, right? There's new driver partners or delivery partners who want to get onboarded at Grab. So if you have all these restrictions around physical proximity and interaction, right, and you do have to do a lot of forms and paperwork, which is part of you know the regulations, how do you do that, right? Yeah. You know, for our own teams as well, if I have a problem with my computer, like, what do I do, right? What's the IT support processes and what have you? So I think, you know, I'm not seeing anything new that anyone hasn't experienced, but in every aspect of, um, you know, our engagement, right? From a personal perspective, from a team perspective, from a business perspective, you really have to sort of, you know, throw away everything that you know and, and sort of rethink, right? What does yeah. it mean in this new, in this new normal? Right. Yeah, right. yeah, and learn a lot of what we've yeah. learned. Oh uh, yeah, uh, Yukesh, and I think one thing's for sure. There's you know clearly momentum for more disruptors as well, right? To to sort of thrive now. So, uh, what would your advice be to you know some of those businesses who are now taking a hard look at how to kind of you know capitalize and maximize what we're seeing happen with consumer behavior, especially? Yeah, so I think uh, well, you know. Uh, very relevant this question right i mean everybody is talking about like people are saying we need to rapidly digitize right and and come businesses like us of course have the advantage we are digital but we also had physical processes which we are working you know first few days we were like you know reconciliation is a big deal people used to sit together now you have to do it remotely you know it's not going to be easy and stuff like that but we've kind of got over that hump others are struggling but the, but the key thing for for uh, my advice and and you know what I feel is very important is like a company like us also we've kind of uh, created solutions to for people to easily partner and go online right uh, for example a remittance as a service solution that we are uh, you know going live with or a banking as a solution you know helps uh, uh, physical uh, partners to go digital very quickly. Uh, so that's something that that we are working on. So so coming back to that, I think it's about partnerships, right? We've also partnered, like you know, we we would have typically gone and tied up with every single uh, financial institution and built our own network because that's our proprietary network. That's what we're proud of. That's what gives us the edge, makes us real time, 
but we've rec like, uh, we've gone and partnered with folks so that we could go live faster in say africa for example where where we had no intention of going right now but you know our customers are demanding it because because now we are expanding beyond uh, some traditional all the other traditional markets that we were so i'm just saying that partnering is very very important partner and and go to market quickly and that's what i i always recommend instead of trying to build everything on your own because mm-hmm. resources are also scarce right the same resources are trying to digitize large companies small companies smes everybody right uh, so uh, you know you have to really uh, partner and, and go forward and that i think is going to be the way fintechs are partnering with each other to, to move forward right and sometimes people ask me thing why why would why would somebody partner with you who is your competition and i'm like we are competitors in certain segments but we are complementary in other and in any case we are much smaller than banks when we get together we grow much bigger both of us so so that's my advice right you know partner and move forward <laughs> so far uh stephanie there's a question coming and i think it sort of is a good segue into my next question to you uh it's basically talking about how digitization has leveled the playing field and made it easier for brands and companies to reach their consumers um of course you know the question is what's the fine line between spamming and just engaging with the consumers but i'm also sort of you know um i want to kind of just extrapolate a little bit and also uh, ask you about uh, you know let's say folks in the audience who are uh, trying to make sure more people discover their brands and you've kind of alluded to this omni channel future sort of approach so tell us what's the best way in you know today's day and age to kind of reach your customer okay um i think there are two parts to 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 the question i think the first one around um you know if you understand uh, the facebook uh, platform we do a lot of personalization at scale so essentially right um you're able to target consumers that are more relevant you know uh to to the product or the service that you're offering uh you know through various like interest targeting you know options and even consumers themselves are able to select like you know what sort of um uh you know what are their preferences right like what do they want to see on the platform so if if you ask me i think uh um facebook uh and i'm 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 referring to facebook family of apps you know like instagram and, and messenger as well um we we're, we're really looking at personalization at scale you're able, so i wouldn't say that uh you, you know we are really t- uh surfacing uh advertising you know um messaging you know that are more relevant uh to to you as a consumer like what you see on my feed is going to be very different from what my husband sees right uh, if i if i look over to my husband's feed i would probably not not resonate with any of those ads that get surfaced there right um so so i just want to address that um secondly i think um can you repeat the second question again uh are they are uh, talking about, yeah yeah sure sure i was talking about how brands need to be future ready when it comes to an omni channel yeah yeah so i talked a little bit about omni channel just now right um mm-hmm. i also give an example shortly but really like you know omni channel uh, is is going to be the way forward you know um you know go, going going forward like i said the phrase right uh, researching online and then purchasing offline really no longer a- applies because discovery and des- decisions are no longer just happening online but people are transacting online so it is really not enough you know uh for companies to just uh influence buying decisions online and then move offline to close the sale uh really companies should be looking at mapping the entire customer journey online and transforming also their marketing and channel mix to become omni channel so I, want, i wanted to talk a little bit about you know uh i think dbs um really demonstrated this this agility right so they pivoted very quickly to a 360 digital approach uh moving away from like traditional like you know above the line campaigns and onto digital platforms So what they did was um they really uh you know they were more contextual when reaching out to consumers during the pandemic as well really engaging them at the right time with the right solutions at and through the right channels. Um if you think about it as well they've also pivoted you know because face to face wasn't allowed right during the um, the circuit breaker in Singapore. So they they were able to like you know introduce a digital wealth advisory service that they called Tally Advisory in March. and they had like 22,000 appointments ever since i mean i was contacted as as uh, you know uh, by by them as well and, and i found it really seamless in the way that they were able to pivot very quickly 
Okay, super. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have about eight minutes left. So, you know, um, another call to the audience is to please uh, send us, you know, any questions that you might have. I have one question that's come on email and I think all our panelists have sort of touched, uh, you know, upon it, but nonetheless, you know, I'm, I'm going to read it out. Uh, it says, do you see a challenge in corporate culture uh, catching up with this fast forwarding of digital adoption? Um, Rana, I think you sort of, you know, tackled it, but any any thoughts that might have been missed out? In terms of challenges on the corporate culture catching up, right? Um, yeah. I mean, it is, I, I think companies will be forced to catch up because if you're not catching up, your competitor will, right? So, mm-hmm. so I think, or, or your people will be unhappy or, you know, bad things will happen maybe. <laughs> maybe I'll put it that way, right? So it's, it's going to be a question of, you know, figuring out how you're going to change and what is the pace of change that is sustainable and manageable and leads you to good outcomes, right? And so you have to be on a bit of a journey. It's not gonna happen completely overnight. So it's gonna be a bit of a journey and then you wanna move as fast as you can on that journey, right? And that the pace at which you move will be dictated by a lot of different factors. But if you're not consciously sort of managing it, monitoring it, then you, know, you will not end up with the best outcome for your team, for your org, for your company, right? So it, it's unavoidable. I mean, you know, um, I, I don't, many of the changes that we're all experiencing are permanent, right? May, mm-hmm. You know, I, I think of it this way. Okay, in a lot of different areas, we may have overcorrected. I don't know if correction is the right word here, but overcorrected, right? So yeah. we're not going to end up in a normal state there. We'll have to retrace a little bit, right? But even if we retrace a little bit, it's very different from what things look like in January of this year. So if we're not setting ourselves up to, you know, hit that sort of, you know, a different endpoint, uh, I don't think works will be successful. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, Yogesh, any thoughts? No, I think uh, I agree with what Rana is saying, but I think uh, if you look at corporate culture, I think uh, it like we finding um, a dichotomy of thoughts, right? I mean, engagement is getting tough, uh, but you know, efficiency has gone up. So mm-hmm. it's almost like you know, do you need that engagement if the efficiency is up, right? I mean, let them be like they're, they're doing a good job, right? I mean, everybody is doing a good job. Let them be. Why do you need engagement? So that's one question, right? And a question to HR, like, you know, do you need to do anything more and stuff like that? But there's some fatigue setting in. And, and the yeah. problem with, uh, with, 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 uh, with in general, what we're seeing and, uh, is that, uh, and this uh, affects consumer behavior. So it's very important is that people are not able to relax. And, and mm-hmm. that's, that's a big challenge, right? Switching off and, you know, you switch off and do what? You stay at home. <laughs> like, what What are you supposed to do? You're doing the same thing over and over again, right? Uh, work has become kind of a, uh, your your idea of, uh, of fun or time pass, right? I mean, otherwise you have nothing else to do uh, unless uh, you can really, uh, you know, binge watch every single serial on Netflix or something like that. But, uh, but apart from that, there has been too much. So, so I think uh, I, I think how do you break that monotony? So how do you kind of really mental health issues are surfacing? So a lot of work that we as a company are doing is to uh, is to support uh, folks and and kind of keep them happy and cheerful. And then there are real problems. People are losing family. People are not able to travel back. People are not able to go and spend time with their loved ones. And it is a real concern. It's like something at the back of your mind. And all of this depresses consumer sentiment, right? And that kind of causes a lot of uh, challenges around, you know, uh, like like after opening up also Singapore, people are not going out, right? I mean, the only certain set of people who are going out, uh, but but there isn't like, is, there isn't kind of a rush, mad rush. There was for a bit, but then it's gone down. And similarly in other countries, we are seeing that. So I just feel that that balance is going to be critical as we move forward. There are no right or wrong answers here. We're going to learn, and everybody is learning as we're going forward. 
but i do feel that uh, that uh, you know uh, for even for hr it's it's it's, it's like five years uh, of of uh, transformation in in one go right <laughs> yeah. so it's it's not easy yeah i finally just add to what yogesh was saying right i i think it's so true that you know you certainly have an increase in efficiency because you're not running from one conference room to another or taking the elevator down or try, trying to set up your projector and what have you right you're well, meeting right? one and a half hours to get to work yeah. like i do you <laughs> yeah, know exactly. you, yeah so, you know yeah. but you just go non stop from one zoom meeting to another to another yeah. to another and so yes i guess efficiency goes up but then you know real questions like you know yogesh was alluding to around mental mm. health right forget all the personal aspects of family and that's impacting you know many others by way of not being able to travel but you know what does it mean by way of mental health for folks is fatigue setting in how do you maintain you know sort of the team spirit that i also mentioned earlier but what does it mean for organizational cultures right i mean you know cultures are built in organization that people come in together right in one location or via different offices people going around so what does the culture look like if we're all going to be remote and you know locked up at home so we have to find a bit of a balance there mm. some Definitely. some work at home will is here yeah. to stay sorry i just went off because i strongly no, 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 feel no, about it no no i i completely agree with uh, what runner and and yogesh is saying i mean like the 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 lines you know are so blurry between work you know and and home i mean uh, for me personally it's uh, is really you know trying to have that discipline uh you know to to step away from my desk um and really have a proper lunch and then come back to it right uh, otherwise you can just keep going cuz it's it's uh you know the work never stops right and um sometimes i think you you yourself need to take a step back but i completely agree with the mental health and you know the corporate culture particularly like you know if there's a new joiner right and you have several new joiners you know that have onboarded you know during this time and they've never even set foot into the office let alone meet you know the people right um so it's and it's difficult particularly if you're living alone as well so i think mental health um issue is very real um it's very difficult when you're away from your family you're living alone you haven't met you know anybody you don't know anybody <laughs> you haven't been to the office you know you don't know how the culture is everything is via virtual right now i mean it's is good um you know it helps but you know i i feel like you know we we really do need to strike a balance okay we're out of time uh, but i'm just going to take the liberty to stretch this conversation because i've got one question and i don't want it to go unanswered riya sharma uh, has sent this question uh, it says since a large chunk of consumers are switching to the digital economy even the ones that used to use offline modes earlier how can a financial services company create an ecosystem where a consumer is able to access multiple products and services in one place for example insurance loans investments payments for online purchases which are some of the things that should be considered to make sure that the customer experience is seamless across platforms uh, yogesh would you like to take a stab at it yeah but well, uh, i think i think that's the business model and a lot of neo banks are going through a lot of companies are transforming even for instagram we are kind of uh, uh, transforming into uh, more than remittance and you know moving towards being a multi product neo banking kind of setup right of course you know the, the advantage that players like us have that we've already acquired customers because customer acquisition is the most expensive thing to do uh, and you know uh, that's what uh, makes facebook uh, stock price go up so for us we have to keep on uh, paying our rents and, and trying to acquire more customers but uh, but having said that uh, i think uh, i think that's what people are trying to build a single experience uh, a, a comprehensive way of doing multiple things people don't want to go to multiple uh, places a super app you know grabs done a great job doing that so once you're in there you want to be there and try and sell multiple products and and try and kind of give multiple experiences to customers of course all of this needs to be at value and and you know this is also competing with banks uh, who are the traditional providers but what we see now is that banks are more open to working with players like us and really be able to give us the back end where we build the interface and and the front end to the customer so that you know the customer experience remains as smooth as what we built the efforts that we've taken to improve that experience every click that we've worked on but at the same time you know it 
it it gives that robustness of a bank which is required at the back end because there's some uh, money uh, that could kind of needs to be safe so that trust and safety so i think it's a good opportunity to partner and create that and that's what everybody is working towards we certainly are working towards it right from our next launch which is in january to you know by the second or third quarter we would have transformed into multiple products so that's that's a way forward and that would be the way uh, people would uh, would work but there would be a key pivot like we have remittances as a pivot right now and then there would be things built around it similarly there will be a key pivot for everybody uh, as we move forward yeah rana yeah maybe i'll add a couple of things right uh, obviously you gauge tosh tosh a lot from a you know financial services standpoint if i think about it just more broadly from you know marketing which i which i work on there's a couple of truisms right one being that digital experiences will replace in person experiences in many cases right that's that's the reality of the future and the second truism is that companies who are you know thinking about these changes and want to adjust to it will be more successful right than if you put your head in the sand so one thing is you know as we mentioned that you know physical and digital lines are getting really blurred nowadays right and, and so if i think of myself as a digital marketer we you know we we often very much approach it okay what are the customer segments right so segments are groups of customers and, and you know when when these lines are getting blurred and it's all becoming digital personalization becomes more important it's not just segments it's about the individual right so stephanie talked about sort of personalization scale and, and so i think you know companies should look at how we can personalize more effectively at scale and so you know this is again very cliche but everyone says customer 360 view blah blah blah, blah. but you know but really how do we get more real time information about customers how do we have a more comprehensive view of identities transactions behaviors um if we can use this intelligence and harness this to drive our marketing strategies that's what will make you know customer consumer experiences better and marketing more effective um and then we have to be i think we also have to be pretty flexible in our mindset and processes right because things will change over time customer preferences will change you know um you know media media choices will change right if no one's going out then why would you want to do out of home advertising right so it's going to shift more towards digital but then if you're you know people start going out again you know out of home will come back so you have to be able to respond to the environment um broader environment and you have to be able to respond to customers at an individual level versus segment level so if you keep progressing on this journey i i think that's probably you know my my two cents to someone to think through this great stephanie closing comments from you then Well I I I like to think that um you know when people think about like Facebook you know family of apps uh they always think about you know Facebook being just only the discovery uh platform right where you you know find out more about new brands and all that but really um I think the platform also very also works very well for for lower funnel strategies so like you know I think the um the the I, um the person who was asking the question said that you know how can we ensure that you know we have a seamless also journey right for a uh, completing you know financial services products uh i do think that um you know is really important i think first of all to understand like uh in in singapore and also in in in, in uh, across up east asia um a lot of the you know discovery and transactions are made through mobile right and uh, a lot of times uh we see that um mobile first creatives uh can can certainly be an area you know to to focus on because a lot of times people are transacting right or through the mobile so make sure you have the right uh creatives uh, that are optimized for mobile and also make sure that you have videos as well because video watching is uh, has is rising exponentially uh i think like by 2021 you're going to see like 90% of uh you know the data traffic is coming through videos so it really do have that mixture of like 
static uh, mobile first creatives as well as videos because you want to make sure that you are reaching out to the right set of consumers in various channels, right? And various pl uh, placements as well. So, you know, don't just look at like, you know, Facebook, uh, just newsfeed, but really across, uh, you know, Instagram, because like for me, like, you know, I, I, I wake up in the morning, I look at my Instagram stories and then I check my messenger and then I go to my Facebook feed, you know, so every, I think you, 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 I think when you get into digital marketing, uh, particularly in, in, in social media, you really need to think about it holistically and not just focus on like, you know, one specific platform. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. That's, that's solid yeah. advice. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. I'm going to then wrap this discussion up. Big thank you to our audience, uh, you know, for also being so engaged and sending so many questions away. Should you have any more questions, please feel free to just send them away and, you know, I can have them answered by each of uh, the panelists. Um, and of course, a big thank you to our panelists uh, for sparing the time and for sharing their insights with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye.